My name is Thomas Struth, I'm an artist and I live in Berlin. The art market is a you know, unavoidable necessity. I mean, it existed, it existed already for a long time. In my lifetime, the art market has changed a lot. When I was, uh, when, when I, when I was young, it was uh, much smaller, there was more silence. Uh, I think I, th I often thought I would, if I would be a young artist, these days, on one hand, there would be an advantage because there's so much uh, c curiosity in, 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 in visual arts uh, compared to 40 years ago or 45 years ago. The, the art market, or the, not the art market, but the, the number of artists, of galleries, of biennials, of museums has increased so much that it's um, the first question for me is always when I look at something I don't know yet, is I, I, I behave like a kind of a doctor with, with a stethoscope. I, like, I, so I, with my eyes on my, you know, my, my heart and my brain, I, you know, I attach, I attach it to what I see, and I, and I first think, what's the degree of truth, or what's the inherent reasoning if that was uh, was active in in the before this this piece of piece of art came to to physical reality um, and uh, uh, yeah that's something I and there's many works where I feel it's I don't know I don't know why they why they exist. I think that uh, that art is sometimes uh, overestimated. You know, I, I, I think that that art sh does not have to be uh, you placed on so many things on so many contexts to make something better that's not good, or like to improve situations, uh, which sometimes it does, of course, or very oftentimes it did and still does, but oftentimes. Uh, it does not, and um, uh, then I think it's not necessary to be there. Well, I think the secondary, this, the so-called secondary market, has a, has a, a certain influence. I mean, the, the, the different sides uh, of this. Uh, on one hand, uh, you know, the, the, the auction houses and the secondary market, you inevitably. It also determines the prices, so that's just what the market does. You have a work. I mean, in my case, you know, let's say you know, 20 years ago, there was an instant, an, an, an incident where somebody bought something for, let's say, 30,000, and then gave it to an auction, like nine months later, and it was auctioned for 240,000. Then, of course, you have a problem because. What do you do then, or do you follow this, or do you, you know, then you raise the prices a bit more, but you don't want to, you become a profit maker for other people. I mean, like, like the art market does, but it's not, you don't want to let that ha uh, happen all the time. Originally, the, the assumption was that people, museums and collectors buy, buy the artwork to live with it and um, and uh, um, to preserve it and so forth and you know on one hand it's understandable that the lives of people cha change and they, they they own something for 20 years and they, then they uh, uh, want to sell it but it's that's never uh, uh, nice for the artist you know, the situation with the Trois de Suite is is that for example in Europe here you get a small percentage of money from all the all the, the auction uh, results you know, that that are made in London or Paris or in Germany. But for example, in America, it's not, not like that. I find that that percentage is a bit too small, so I think it should be maybe like 100 percent more or something like that. This is a question that has been negotiated uh, in a certain way. I mean, the art market. It's a, it's, it's a very unusual 
place because of the absence of of your contracts. I mean, I've, I've never had a contract with any of the galleries I work with. It's all uh, like just agreement, like a like an oral agreement between the gallerists and myself. And on one side, that's something wonderful because it's it's it it, it relies on trust and mutual respect. So that's a wonderful situation. My brother is a, is a judge, so he's a lawyer and a judge, and he always laughs and says, this is the in, in, in incredible milieu because you have, you know, there's, there's hundreds of millions that go over the table every year, but there's practically no contracts, you know, which is extremely unusual. I work with Marion Goodman and Max Hetzler, uh, you know, just to name two examples, for a very long time with Max since uh, 19, 86 and with a man since 1989 and we know each other very well I mean we know each other very well as artists and dealers and colorists but also like politically and just uh, the private life uh, which is somewhat inevitable because it's a personal relationship also and um, we trust each other a lot so there's a very uh, trustful relationship with Marion Goodman there's a very particular section of artists in the gallery. There's a little bit like a family situation where everybody respects each other, you know, like by and large. Uh, it's you're similar with Max's uh, group of artists, even though he's maybe a bit more expensive and ex experimental and so forth. Yeah, I think I'm I'm just I don't know I'm just someone who who doesn't move galleries so easily. So I'm kind of. I, 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 for me, it's important to have a have a strong relationship uh, that will also go with my experiments, or when I change something, so that they that they are supportive, and you know, that they're good advisors. You know that the, you know that they that they well, that I can come to them uh, with questions that I have not so particular about my work, about um, you know yeah, how to deal with. Uh, the invitations that I get, does it make sense? You know, what What do you think about this? And uh, and also as the first uh, spectators of my work, the first you know, critics of my work, when I have something new to to see, is that you know would they support this or and even like if they wouldn't, yeah, then to ask them what, what is why, you know, what do you think about it or so. There are there are um, very selective people uh, who I trust a lot or who, whose opinion means a lot to me, uh, and the, you know, that sort of give me uh, you know, like maybe you, you help me to overcome you know, uh, uh, my own uncertainty or so so so, so of course. Uh, 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 my wife, because she, she she's what I do first, and she's kind of a, uh, a critical pusher in certain situations. Says that's good, but you have to you go further. You have to sort of uh, that's not enough, something like that. And then of course the man and Max, I have a, play a particular role in this. Uh, then I've you know, my publisher Lothar Schirmer is someone who. who Whose, whose relationship to art is extremely deep and extremely uh, you know, knowledgeable and complex. And then there's a few other friends of mine who I who I know for a long time and and where where I know that they they tell me what they think. They don't have to flatter me or they don't have to you know they they, they don't have to please me or anything like that. So. Um, so that's very that, that, that's quite important. But of course, I'm I'm uh, very self-critical. So I'm not I, I uh, yeah I'm 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 yeah I'm my first critic. So you know, and, and which I think especially with photography, or let's say if you if the means you use of photographs, it's very important because it's so it's so you know it's you really have to. You ask your production every piece. Is that really what I mean, or is that how does that work, or so? And is it really 
in which of the pictures I made really, really fulfill what I, what I wanted. And that's also sometimes not so easy to find out. So like sometimes I have to live with something for quite a long time and then I, I might reject it because I feel well, it, like it doesn't hold up uh, enough. Or it's maybe the, the, what I thought was too simple or it's sort of this kind of, you tend to attach yourself to something I don't really, I didn't really mean or it could also happen that it's, it goes into another direction. It, it could be in a body of work that have five pictures that I think were well, exactly what I meant, but then I kind of you stretch it out, and there's some you know, like some some exceptions of the rule that makes the rule more you know, more visible. To do a very big exhibition, which you might call a, a retrospective, takes maybe a preparation time of two years or so, and then partly it requires building. You know, it's a complicated process. You have to you have the given spaces. And then you, you have to make selection of work. You have to see how it how it works and how it should be uh, orchestrated in the different uh, venues. Sometimes I build a rather large scale maquette of the spaces to figure out how the position of the works could go. But then, of course, it depends on where the uh, where the exhibition takes place and in which uh, cultural setting. Everything should be included, or like excerpts of everything I've done, or or just a particular theme. For example, I did a larger exhibition that was called uh, Nature and Politics that started in Essen and went to Berlin and then to, to three venues in America, in Atlanta, Houston and St. Louis. There was just one body of work or like a retrospective of one body of work, which for me is sort of uh, a bit more simple in a way and, and uh, less uh, demanding. If, if it's a larger retrospective, it was, uh, several bodies of work it gets complicated because the work um, it resonates differently. Every single body of work resonates and functions very differently in space. Um, yeah, I was trained or I grew up with minimal and conceptual art where the awareness of the artwork itself and the placement of it and how that works together was very uh, was a very um, fantastic school to go through and, and so that means that I'm extremely aware of uh, how my work should be installed and what's the best uh, placement of every single photograph in a, in a big show which, which might, which very often leads to even if I have the selection and I build a model and so forth I still you change sometimes a lot in the space to find the best uh, resonating location of every work in, in, the, in, in the entire space. I think my ideal of a contemporary art museum is a little bit difficult to, uh, to manifest. I think it should be, it should have a kind of a small entrance and big, big spaces for the art work and I think uh, the architecture should uh, not be uh, driven by vanity. Um, it should be simple. I would like that the lighting systems would be uh, non-prominent as pieces of the sculpture from the ceiling. I think it would need um, the different uh, sizes of spaces for more intimate um, uh, observation and for be more grand uh, orchestration. I think uh, it would be good if it had some kind of silence around it. Um, it could also be a different urban a kind of museum that would be around it, surrounded by your city activity and lots of people. And I liked, in the past, I liked spaces that are um, like project rooms. You're like porticos in, in uh, Frankfurt, which is you come in, you have one space and there's no, no, uh, 
you things cannot hide, or so you make maneuvers that are you distract from kind of truth. I think it would be good if exhibitions you would you would last long. You know, I think that exhibitions could last like eight months or seven months. That people have thought that they sit and settle, and then many people can see them. When you go to to any any museum or uh, these days, you see a lot of people who, when they see something, like like a second later, they raise, they take their phone out of the pocket and make a photograph, and then instead of looking at the work, they walk away. So it's a strange, you're hunting and catching of things without really looking at them. So I would, uh, I would uh, maybe add to the ideal museum that it's mandatory for the audience that they leave their phones and their cameras uh, in the lockers. That just would be a worthwhile attempt to make that a rule. It seems to me that people are they're overwhelmed by the presence of a work and then they, they, they think they uh, have to keep a memory, a pictorial memory for themselves in their own private uh, device to be, uh, look at it later because it's, it's kind of, I, I don't really know what, what the overall psychological uh, palette of reasons uh, is why people do that, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of worrisome in a certain way. The question of the social responsibility as an artist is, in, in, in my opinion, easily answered is you, 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 that my, like my responsibility towards other people is represented by, by my work and by that, I'm, that I only publish something that I really mean. So I'm, I'm sort of, uh, yeah, I think I hope that I, you get my work teaches in a, in a certain way by, by the manner of observation or by the selections and the choices I make. And um, uh, I was a teacher in like 25 years ago for three years uh, and I, I enjoyed it. And I work sometimes, I have interns at the studio for three months each time and then there's certain rules that I, that I there's certain, certain things that we, yeah, that I do uh, in contact with them. They you know, witness, they come with me photographing a few times and they do, they, they do a project during that time. So I'm teaching in that respect. I'm, I'm teaching sometimes in, at the studio, but uh, yeah, I'm a contemporary a participant in our time and I react and I'm, yes, so speak, speak through my work. And when you speak, you speak, when you speak, anybody can learn, can, can respond or can, can use what I have to say and do something with it uh, as they wish. And I think that's a, yeah, the great uh, side of art and music and literature uh, is that it's a kind of space of, of a certain freedom of consideration and, and dialogue and conversation uh, that is not propaganda, that is not, you know, but, but the audience, the reader, the spectator has a certain kind of freedom in, in a way to c connect, you have to talk about it with other people and just as a field of, 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 um, of uh, reflection, both intellectual and emotional. And I think that's a very, uh, that's a good, good quality. I think my work is always political in, in one way or another, but it's not uh, propagandistic. I, I, I don't like, I don't like, um, like easy uh, suggestions in, in one direction or another. And I'm, I'm, I'm not avoiding it, but I, um, I, um, uh, I hope you know, that, that, that my political opinions are sort of embedded in, in my choices and, and the result of uh, what I looked at, how I edited it, and um, uh, how it can be read. Uh, in, in Israel and Palestine, it was a particular uh, challenge in a way to um, 
to, to, to make choices or to find reasons what to photograph uh, and how to frame it and how, who, which kind of pictures I, I selected from the many pictures I took. I mean, I took like maybe 2,000 pictures, just uh, snapshots you know, while I was traveling and while I was thinking about it and then to, to find out which of those snapshots uh, stayed in my memory in a way, it didn't fade or didn't get rejected and so slowly I, I narrowed it down and in the end there were like 17 or 18 pictures from, from, from I think eight visits or so and it was a particularly uh, long process. If you ask me what the, what the development of the curve of a of a, of, a, of a process is the, the first thing is you know, to to identify like to identify you, you reason why I want to do something uh, you know, that particular body of work or that kind of your narrative it becomes important to me or that kind of um, problem also that I uh, that I w w would like to to talk about or, or e evaluate and so forth and the 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 the, um, this time of sitting with the question of what is you know, what are my reasons is very important in, in the beginning because I've you know I have many ideas you know, all the time but I don't like idea art you know, because it's like many people are very have a very fluid and and, and smart mind so they can have can have ideas every morning uh, and uh, but they don't all need to have they don't need to be materialized. Uh, all the time, and then, but that also, the, 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 then you have to sort of, the thing is to, you start working and materializing the work, and starting to produce the work, I'm still examining, you know, does that fulfill my reasoning of what I, what, I, what I initially thought and how does it work? For example, with these pictures of the animals, I, I came over a long, long process to start doing this, but then when I photographed the first uh, animal, the sheep here, the, which turned out to be just a picture of the head of a sheep with an open eye, because it had died that morning. Um, uh, then I started to see what I, wow, wow, how it could function. So as I'm going along and I'm producing the work, I'm still always testing it with the how, with that still fits with what I thought, what my desire was, what I wanted to do. And, and then also I know quite well, for example, when, when I photographed streets and cities, I knew that's, that would be a work that, you know, that can include a lot of work, would become a very big body of work. Uh, family portraits, also, it's also something I'm, I'm always interested in. And if, they, if the number of family pictures are made, becomes bigger and bigger, it gets more and more interesting because you can make different comparisons and so forth. But there's certain bodies of work where I knew this is more like a statement, for example, photographing jungle, the new pictures of paradise, I knew that's just there might be 35 pictures or 40 and that's it. And these pictures of, of dead animals is also I'm quite certain will you know will have maybe 40, 50 pictures and it doesn't need 200 pictures because it's not an uh, encyclopedia uh, of animals. Uh, that's not what I want. <laughs>